in this hour we will review complex power through some examples and we will establish the very useful fact that complex power is conserved. We begin by the following example. Okay, consider this one port that's part of a circuit in sinusoidal steady state. Okay. N plus minus V and this is the current I. N is in sinusoidal steady state. Okay. Suppose that the voltage across the terminals of R1 port is measured to be 3 cosine 4t plus some phase of 30 degrees volts and I of t is 6 cosine 4t and let's leave the phase of the current as theta i okay amps okay we're going to consider two cases depending on uh, uh, some value of theta i. In case A, suppose that the phase of the current is minus 20 degrees. Okay. Now let's see the implication of this phase okay, from the power point of view. Now let's write down the phases. So for the voltage we have 3 as the magnitude and 30 degrees as the phase, okay, volts and the phase of the current, I, is 6 and minus 20 amps, okay. So, once we have the voltage and the current, we can simply compute complex power which we define as one half times the phasor uh, voltage phasor times the conjugate of the current phasor okay so s equals one half v i star i star means conjugate of i and that reads what okay three times six eighteen divided by two that makes nine so nine is the magnitude of the complex power, in other words, the apparent power is 9 volt amps. As for the phase, we have 30 degrees coming from the phase of uh, V, and since we are taking the conjugate, minus minus 20 coming from the current, so 30 plus 20, that makes 50 degrees, okay? Volt amps, so that's the complex power associated to this one port. So, Let's apply the definitions that we introduced in our previous lecture. For this one port, therefore, we can say the apparent power is, well, which is defined as the magnitude of the complex power, which is sitting here, 9 volt amps. Okay, so that's the apparent power for our one port. Then the real power or active power was the uh, the real part of the complex power, which is nine times cosine fifty degrees s cosine fifty degrees, which is approximately five point eight. Okay, the unit is since we're talking about real power, the unit is watts. Okay, so this is our real power. And the imaginary part of the complex power we call the reactive power and denoted by the letter capital Q. And Q is S sine 50 degrees which approximately is 6.9. And the units for reactive power was volt amp reactive, okay, VAR. So we have 6.9 VAR for 
the reactive power. Okay, now for the second case, suppose that the current, the phase of the current is measured to be 140 degrees. Okay, now let's see what that implies from the power point of view. Again, let's write, let's begin by writing down the phasors of voltage and current. V is the same, 30 degrees, and this time the current reads 6 and 140 amps. Okay. Since we have V and I, we can uh, easily compute the complex power. So S therefore equals again the same magnitude, but this time the phase is 30 minus 140, so, so that makes minus 110 degrees, okay, volt amps. Okay. Once we have the complex power, let's also list the uh, the, its components, namely apparent power, real power, and reactive power. So that implies that the apparent power hasn't changed. It's still at 9 volt amps. P is S cosine hun minus 110 degrees, okay, which equals minus 3.1 watts. Okay. And as for Q, it's S cosine minus 110 degrees. Excuse me, that's sine 100 minus 110 degrees. Which reads minus 8.5 volt amp reactive. Okay, now let's interpret uh, this result. Now, since P turned out to be negative for the second case, it means that R1 port is, in a sense, active, okay? One possibility, therefore, is there is an independent, independent source inside. So, on the average, this guy is supplying energy to the circuit that is connected to, okay? So, since P turned out to be negative and is an active one port. There is an independent source inside, okay. for instance. Okay, so let's move on to our next example. terms of the one port that can be represented by an impedance. Okay, plus minus V and I. So the voltage and current are directly given as phasors. So what else we've given? The RMS value or the effective value of the volt voltage is 100 volts. The real power Okay, delivered to this one port is 5 kilowatts and the power factor for this one port is 0.8 and it's leading. Okay, therefore this is a capacitive one port, meaning that the reactive power has to be negative. And for this uh, set of information, 
we are asked to find the following quantities. Find s complex power, magnitude of s, namely apparent power, q the reactive power, z the impedance of this one port, and finally the effective value or the RMS value of the one port current R. Okay, here goes the solution. Now, since power factor is leading, the reactive power has to be negative. So, what we do is we draw the power triangle with vertical side pointing down. Okay, so this is 90 degrees. Hypotenuse is the apparent power as this is theta, cosine of which is the power factor, 0.8, and this side is the real power. And we know what it is. It's given 5 kilowatts, okay? So it's 5,000 watts. And this is our reactive power, Q, which is one of the things that we have to figure out. So, cosine theta is the power factor. 0.8. Therefore, theta equals either arctangent 3 over 4 or arctangent minus arctangent 3 over 4. Because power factor is leading, we know that the theta is between 0 and minus 90 degrees. Therefore, theta has to be minus arctangent 3 over 4. Okay, we, ha we have the 3, 4, 5 triangle. And then apparent power since real power is apparent power times the power factor, we can compute apparent power simply by doing the reverse operation. Okay, P over cosine theta. So that's 5,000 over 0.5, uh, 0.8. So that reads, okay, 6,200. 50 uh, volt amps or 6.25 kilovolt amps. Okay, so that's our apparent power. And how about the reactive power? Reactive power, well, we have the hypotenuse, we have this right side, we can easily compute Q because we know that Q has to be negative. Q squared plus P squared must equal uh, this magnitude of S square, from there we can pull Q. Q equals, okay, hypotenuse times the sine theta, okay, that's 6.25 times theta is minus arctangent 3 over 4, or cosine theta is, uh, cosine theta is 0 0.8, okay. 0 0.8, 0 0.8 squared plus sine theta squared equals 1. And we know that sine theta has to be negative. Therefore, sine theta is minus 0 0.6. Minus 0 0.6. And that produces minus 3.75 kilovolt and reactive. Okay? We use VAR because we're talking about the reactive power. So let's put that in a box. Okay. So we have Q, we're given P. So P is the real part of S, Q is the imaginary part of S. All we have to do to figure out S is combine those two pieces together. Hence, we can write S equals P plus JQ. And that reads 5 kilowatts for P and minus 3.75 kilovolt uh, amp uh, reactive for Q, and that makes 5 minus J 3.75 volt kilovolt amps. Okay, that's our complex power. Okay. Uh, okay. So those are computed. Let's figure out the remaining two variables, the current and the impedance. Okay. 
So we have apparent power equals VRMS IRMS. Okay. So uh, right, apparent power is the product of the effective values of the voltage and current that appears at the port terminals. And in this equation, we have the apparent power. We're given the uh, RMS value of the voltage. Therefore, we can easily compute the RMS value of the current. Therefore, I RMS or I effective equals apparent power 6,250 volt amps divided by 100 volts, okay, which reads 62.5 amps. So that's our effective value for the current. And finally, we can uh, figure out impedance by using the relation between impedance, effective value of the current, and the complex power. Okay? Note that for a one port that can be represented by its impedance, complex power simply was proportional to the impedance, and the proportional to constant was square of the RMS value of the current. In other words, S equaled Z times I RMS square. Hence, Z equals 5000 minus J3750. That's our complex power. And in the denominator, we have the square of the effective value of the current. Okay, 62.5 square. And that reads uh, in polar form 1.6 minus arc tangent 3 over 4. Okay. Now this theta, which is the phase of the complex power, must be same as theta, uh, the phase of the impedance, okay? Because those two complex numbers are related to one another through this uh, real and more importantly positive number. And in rectangular coordinates, this can be written as 1.28 minus J 0 0.96 ohms. Okay, so this is the resistance of our one port, and minus 0 0.96 is the reactance of our one port. Since the reactance is negative, we uh, we're dealing with a capacitive one port, which was uh, which we already knew from this word because the power factor is leading. Okay, now uh, we will talk about a very interesting and useful concept, namely the conservation of complex power. Okay, now from 201, or by Telegraph's theorem, we know that the uh, instantaneous power in a circuit must be conserved. Now, using Telegraph's theorem, in phasor domain, we will obtain the fact that the complex powers in a circuit in sinusoidal steel state must also be conserved. And the uh, demonstration is quite straightforward and interesting, so let's go uh, through go through it with uh, together. Okay. Now let's talk about conservation of power. Okay. Now, let's introduce the notation that we will use for our analysis. Given a circuit, an LTI circuit in sinusoidal steady state, whose graph has n branches. Okay. We label the uh, voltages of those branches as V1, V2 up to Vn, we are in phasor domain, and likewise the currents will be denoted by I1, I2 up to In. Okay, so V1, V2, and so on, Vn, they will represent the voltage phasors for the associated branch. 
P voltage phasers. And we construct the vector V, okay, by stacking all those complex numbers. So V is V1, V2, Vn. Okay, that's our branch voltage vector. And we're going to do the same thing or the dual thing to the currents. Okay, let I1, I2 up to IN be our current phasers. Okay, and likewise, we let by I uh, represent the current vector, okay, whose entries are the phasers of currents. Okay, now, since KVL and KCL hold in phasor domain, we can use some early results, which eventually will take us to what we want, namely the conservation of power. Now, by KVL, we know that we can write voltage, okay, in terms of, or the voltages in terms of, or the branch voltages in terms of node voltages. In vector notation, we can write, that is, V equals A transpose times E, where A is our reduced incidence matrix, representing the graph that's representing our circuit, where E is the node voltage vector. Okay, and A is our reduced incidence matrix. Okay. And then this matrix, reduced incidence matrix, also appears in uh, expressing KCL for the for the circuit. Namely, by KCL we have that the current vector lies in the null space of reduced incidence matrix. In other words, AI equals zero. Now this implies that you take the conjugates of both sides, it still is true. Okay, so let's do that. AI conjugate equals zero conjugate, which is zero. Okay, by the way, this is the zero vector. Now that implies A star times I star equals zero, but A, the reducing system matrix, is a real matrix. The entries were zero, one, and minus one. Therefore, A star and A are the same matrices. Therefore, we can write this as A times I star equals zero. Okay. Which means that if the current phasers satisfy KCL, okay, you obtain a new set of uh, currents by simply conjugating your old set. That new set must also satisfy KCL. So that's how. That's one way to look at the uh, equality. Okay, and. We were able to perform this implication because, as, as I said, A is a real matrix, okay? Because A is a real matrix. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to combine these two equations and look at them from the complex power point of view, and that will tell us something very interesting and useful. Now let's write down the total complex power in our circuit. Okay, we call it S 
total. And by that we simply mean you go branch by branch for each branch or for each component. You compute the uh, complex power and then you sum all those n complex numbers. And that sum we're calling as total. Okay, k 1 to n 1 half vk ik star. Okay, so this is the complex power corresponding to the kth branch or the kth component. And then we're summing all of those n numbers and we're calling the sum as total. Okay. Now this summation can be written compactly using our vector notation. Okay, v and i. That equals one half v transpose. Okay, multiplying the conjugate of the current vector. Okay, i conjugate simply is i one conjugate, i two conjugate, and so on. Now that equals one half times. Now v was a transpose e. Therefore v transpose is e transpose times a. So we can write this as e transpose times a. This v transpose. And that's multiplying i star. Okay. I star. And then we know that. Okay, this was V transpose and A times I star equals zero. Therefore, regardless of the node voltages, this must always be zero. So, S total, defined as such, must therefore be zero. Okay, hence S total equals zero and this equality can be interpreted as that the complex power throughout the circuit must be conserved and complex power is therefore conserved okay now Let's also investigate the implications of this equality on the, uh, the real powers throughout the circuit and also the reactive powers throughout the circuit. In particular, are they also conserved along with the complex power? So now we can write SK, which is defined as one half VK IK star, can be written as some real part plus some imaginary J time the imaginary part, and then real part we called the real power corresponding to the kth branch and the imaginary part is called the reactive power, QK, okay, corresponding to the kth branch or the kth component. Okay, so this is the complex power of the kth branch. Okay, now let's rewrite this equation as total equals zero in terms of p's and q's. So zero equals the sum of complex powers. Okay, that's the sum k equals one to n sk's. Okay, and each sk is pk plus jqk, and this pk plus jqk can be written as two separate summations as follows k equals 1 to n pk plus j times the summation k equals 1 to n qk now the left hand side is 0 
and here we have a real part plus the imaginary part j times the imaginary part if this is zero so that means real part separately must be zero and imaginary part separately must be zero and that means the real power and reactive power are also conserved throughout uh, the circuit okay so that implies k equals 1 to n pk equals 0 and the same holds for the reactive part equals 0 in other words or in less mathematical terms both real and reactive powers throughout any circuit are conserved which is an interesting fact also a very useful fact from the computation point of view okay now let's uh, consider the following example let's associate it to our new discovery have some source and then that source is connected to two loads that are connected in parallel and in between there is this piece and this piece can be thought as uh, as the representation of the transmission lines let's say okay so the circuit directly is given in phasor domain so here we have Vs, the phase of the input or the source voltage. This is one half ohms, and this is Jx ohms. This is the current extracted from the source. Okay. I. This is L1, uh, L4 load, and this is L2, the second load. They're connected. In parallel, therefore, they share the same voltage. And that voltage is denoted by V sub L, the load voltage. Okay. Now, regarding this uh, circuit, the following measurements are made. Uh, let's write that down. First load. Okay, L1. is consuming 4 watts of real power okay and it's known to be a resistive load meaning that its power factor is as high as possible namely one second load l2 is operating at 5 volt amp apparent power Okay, and the power factor PF2 equals 0 0.6 and we are told that the load is capacitive. Therefore, we write power factor is leading power factor. Okay, and finally, complex power supplied okay by the source indicated by s sub s equals 9 plus j7 volt amps okay now since the word supplied is used this means ss one half times vs times the conjugate of the current leaving 
the, uh, the source, okay? Or, therefore, right, so that's what SS is because the word supplied is used, okay? So that's, that's given, and we asked for the following, find the effective value of this current that's extracted from the source, the reactance, okay, X, the effective value of the load voltage, VL, effective or VL RMS, they are the same thing. And finally, the effective value of the source voltage, okay, VS effective. So once again, that's the information that we are given. First load is, regarding first load, uh, first load, we have this piece of information. This watt implies that this is the real power, and the word resistive implies that the power factor is one, okay? Therefore, the reactive power for this guy is zero. And here we have the information for the second load. This unit, volt amp, indicates that it's, uh, this is the apparent power that's given, and uh, the power factor is 0 0.6, and this word leading means that this is a capacitive load, namely the reactive power is negative, or the imaginary part of the impedance is negative, and so on. And here we have the complex power supplied by the source, which means that if we consider all this thing as a single one port, seen by the source, then the complex power of that one port is 9 plus J7 volt amps, okay? We have to be careful about these uh, subtleties. Okay, now, based on that information, we will try to figure out the asked variables, namely effective value of the current, reactance X, the effective values of the voltage both at the source side and the load side. Okay, let's begin our solution. S1, so this S1 indicates the complex power consumed by uh, the first load, L1. S1 is, okay, the real power or the real part of S1 is here, 4 watts. It's a resistive load, therefore reactive uh, power is 0, therefore S1 equals 4 volt amps, or let's write it more formally, 4 plus J0 volt amps. Okay, and S2, the complex power for the second load, L2, is we know the uh, the apparent power, we, we know the magnitude of the complex power, and we know cosine theta and sine theta. Cosine theta is 0 0.6, and sine theta is minus 0 0.8, because the power factor is leading. So that means S2 equals the magnitude times cosine theta plus J times sine theta, okay, which reads, 3 minus J4 volt amps. Okay. Now, SS equals, so that's the power supplied by the source. By conservation of power, that must equal, okay, so I'm going to call this together as, a, as the third one port whose impedance is Z3 and the corresponding complex power is S3. Now, since complex power is conserved, the supplied power, complex power, SS, 9 plus J7, must be, okay, shared by S, uh, this one port, or this impedance, Z3, L1 and L2. In other words, SS must equal S1 plus S2 plus S3, okay? 
from conservation. S1 plus S2 plus S3. Okay, once again, S3 is the power associated to Z3. This and that considered as a single one port, or Z3 times effective value of the current square. Okay, now in this equation, we know SS, we know S1, and we know S2. Therefore, S3 can easily be figured out. So we have 9 plus J7 equals 4 for S1, 3 minus J4 for S2 plus S3, the complex power for the transmission line. Hence, S3 equals 2 plus J11 volt amps. Okay, so that's S3. And then S3 equals, if you know the impedance, uh, you can easily, if you know the impedance and the current, you can compute the complex power. This time we know the, uh, we know the complex power only, and we will have to figure out Z3 and the effective value of the current. So S3 equals impedance times the current square. I effective square. Okay, so that equals one half I effective square because Z3 is one half plus Jx. Okay, plus Jx I effective square. And S3 is here 2 plus J11. Okay. Although this is a single equation, this is a complex equation, therefore we have two separate equations, which is nice because we have two unknowns, namely I effective and X. By equating the real parts, we see that I effective must be uh, 2, okay, 2 amps, and once we have I effective, I effective squared is 4, 4x four equals 11, and x must be 11 over 4 ohms. Okay, so I effective must be 2 amps, and then this guy is 11, which produces x equals 11 over 4 ohms. Okay, so these two quantities are computed. Now let's move on. What we have is VL effective times I effective equals what? Okay. Now this equals, let's consider this as a single one port. Okay. Where the port is here. For that single one port, we know, okay, the voltage is denoted by VL, the load voltage, and the current, if you, if you want, you can uh, consider this IL, the current is I. Now, for this uh, combination of L1 and L2, consider the single one port, for this load, consider together the complex, uh, the apparent power must equal the effective value of the voltage, times the effective value of the current, okay? Therefore, VL effective times I effective equals the apparent power of this combination, okay? Now, the complex power of this combination, due to conservation of power, must equal S1 plus S2. Hence, the apparent power of this combination is the magnitude of S1 plus S2, okay? So this equals, thanks to conservation of power, S1 plus S2. Okay. It would be a very big mistake to write VL effect. This equals, for instance, apparent power of L1 plus apparent power of L2, namely magnitude of S1 plus magnitude of S2. Okay. So apparent power is not conserved. Complex power is conserved and its components are conserved, like the real power and the reactive power, but apparent power uh, is, uh, is, not, is not conserved. Okay, so we use once again conservation power and write that. We know I effective, we know S1 and S2, 
therefore we can compute s1 plus s2 from that we can compute the magnitude and that will give us the effective value of the load voltage okay so that implies vl effective equals the magnitude of s1 plus s2 okay which is here 7 minus j4 7 minus j4 divided by the effective value of the current which we computed uh, before and that reads okay approximately uh, 4 volts okay so that's also computed finally what remains is vs effective and for that we can use the same uh, idea vs effective i effective equals the apparent power supplied by the source which is the magnitude of 9 plus j7 ss okay therefore vs effective must equal 9 plus j7 magnitude divided by the current which equals square root of 130 divided by 2 volts okay and that finishes our example where we use uh, at two places the conservation of power in fact three three places